You're watching CCS, Clarksville Community Network. Produced by Goodwin Productions. Powered by CDE Lightband. Both my family and my wife's family had art in their homes. My wife and I and our daughter lived in Northern Virginia in 70 and 71 while I was in the military. And that's when I acquired my first watercolor. The exhibit that we've now named the Art of Clarksville, the James T. Mann Collection, has a wonderful story behind coming to the museum as part of our permanent collection. In all my years, I wasn't collecting it for purposes of being called a James Mann Collection. It's not necessarily that I did it with a driving purpose, but I was also trying to identify people that most people maybe have never heard of. And I was disappointed that really good works of art were not selling for what they ought to sell for. These paintings, photographs of places in Clarksville that don't exist now, help tell people the history of our community. As I would go to different meetings around the country, I would always stop and look at art dealers and see what was available and things like this and see if I could afford anything. I became the managing officer of First Federal in the early 80s and I was also on the board of a number of nonprofits that were having auctions to raise money for those nonprofits. And I was very disappointed in the fact that many good works of art were selling for next to nothing. I think some of them were selling for less than the price of the framing. This just did not help the artists, it did not help the charities. So I decided that on behalf of First Federal, I would start bidding on some of these works, some of which I acquired, some of which I encouraged other people to acquire at a little higher price. James Mann and his financial institution, First Federal Savings and Loan, began collecting this art as a way of supporting the artists in our community to let them know that their work was valuable and appreciated by the residents of the community and particularly the supporters of the Customs House Museum. Jim Mann's just a great asset to um, building this body of work of Clarksville and really was one of the first people to do so in helping the artists as well as helping the community preserve these historical uh, images that are not just photographs that you would normally see, but representations in oils and watercolors. Not all of the artists were well known at that time because in those early days of the auction, you did not have the downtown artist co-op. And so there was no outlet for many people who do art as a hobby. But they did nice work, but they had no venue other than these auctions in which to display their art and hopefully sell some of their art. And that's basically how it got started. The museum decided that they needed a major fundraiser and so they decided a, a dinner auction would be a nice way of encouraging people in the community to donate to the museum. I guess where I really, really got personally involved in it is my wife was chair of that in the early 90s. At those times, I was becoming more and more aware of what was going on because Flying High was the auction in those days. I became acquainted with the auctioneer and so the auctioneer just needed to look at me and I would just barely dip my head 
to let him know that I would raise the bid to what he was suggesting. And this was a way of me not being absolutely picked on by raising prices and this sort of thing. But it worked pretty well. Prices did go up to a reasonable level. And I acquired a fair collection of artwork. Now, if you look at the artwork, I, I'll have to say my personal preference is probably for buildings and structures that exist or do not exist today in Clarksville and in our community. The collection reflects a lot of the history of Clarksville to show the new residents of Clarksville, the children of Clarksville, what Clarksville looked like over the years. What I love about this collection is it really represents a historic tour of our town well over a hundred year time period because the scenes of some of these paintings reflect back on Clarksville's early history, uh, mid 1800s forward. What I think is really exciting about this collection is the variety and styles of mediums that the artists have used over the years to interpret um, historical moments within our community. There are scenes depicted by 19 local area artists, all of whom were highly skilled and very competent in their artistic craft, and they recorded scenes that represent Clarksville's past in a very, very stylish and wonderful interpretation. Those paintings and these different subject matters represent past buildings and historic sites that some no longer exist, some that are still with us. Some represent scenes of local life and everyday life of the citizens of Clarksville. Some represent more noble causes and more events that, that made Clarksville the city it is today. So it's a wonderful compilation of styles and images and artistic interpretation. Well, the largest collection is that of Peg Harville. Evans Harville, her husband, was our corporate attorney after his partner, Billy Daniel, retired as attorney. So I knew them very well. And when we moved our mortgage loan facility across the street because we needed more space, I needed some additional artwork because we had a lot of different offices and stuff like that and they just looked very plain. And so I asked Peg if she had any work that I might acquire. And she says, oh, I've got a whole room full of stuff that I, I've never done anything with, never tried to sell. You can come out to the house and rummage through it, anything you want, just take. And so this is where a, a lot of Peg stuff came from. Peg Harville and her husband Evans lived on Dunbar Cave Road. So a number of her paintings involve Dunbar Cave, which most people have heard of because it still exists today. During the heyday of Dunbar Cave, they had big name entertainment that would come and perform there. The other part of Dunbar Cave, there was a hotel. Dunbar Cave was a place where in the hot summers, people could come and partake of the cool air from the cave. And they could also partake of the mineral water that was at the Idaho Springs Hotel. And this painting is a painting of the Idaho Springs Hotel, which was up on the hill on the other side of Dunbar Cave Road, overlooking the face of the cave. I grew up knowing the Harwell family. They were members of the Methodist Church with me. I knew Kitty Harville as a young girl growing up. And I knew that in her career, she had become quite a good artist, especially of wildlife. And she has decided to return to Clarksville. 
And so the museum asked her if she would consider doing a painting for the signature piece for the museum. Her mother, by the way, had done, I believe, the first 10 flying high paintings. So she had done many, many paintings for the museum. Kitty thought about it and she says, golly, I don't think I can compete with my mother. Is there something else that I could do? And in, in talking to Frank Lott, the, the director of the museum, they walked through the museum and they found the postmaster's office and said, this might give a nice background for a painting. She found a picture of her mother as a seven or eight year old girl. And so she drew a picture of her mother there in front of the postmaster behind the, the half door in his office. Here's the signature piece. You see the, the postmaster and a, a young girl standing there holding a stick horse. And that young girl is based on a photograph that Kitty had of her mother. Flying High was gonna be held just across the state line in Kentucky. And again, because of the size of the painting, I thought to myself, you know, that painting won't fit in most houses because of the size. So it's gonna to have to be a bank or an institution that has large walls to acquire it. That painting, really because of the history of it, with Peg Harville's involvement with the Flying High program, and Kitty's painting of Peg means that that painting ought to be part of the museum's permanent collection. By the end of the auction, the painting had raised $56,900. It set a record for the auction of a single painting in the history of the museum and probably helped the museum raise the most money they have ever raised. Another artist that I remember, Danny Goodrum. So I have a number of paintings by Danny. There are three features in each of those paintings that are similar, but really have nothing to do with the purpose of the painting. And if you look at those three pictures, you will see them perhaps, but there is a dog, a young boy, and an old car in different positions in these pictures. If you look at this painting of the women's building, you can see in the painting the dog and the boy and the car parked on the street. This building I became very, very acquainted with as a young child because I was an avid reader. And the women's building housed the only library in Clarksville at that time. And if you went down Main Street where you see the vehicle park, there was an entrance to the lower level of the building and that's where the library was. The building was right at the intersection of North 2nd Street and Main Street. And now is where Jack Turner has his office next to the Presbyterian Church. Now, if you go down to the painting of the museum, you'll see the same three features, not necessarily the same situation. For example, in the painting of the train station, the boy is reading a book, is stretched out with the dog sort of behind him, and then the, the car is parked over at the train station. Particularly the one on Franklin Street, he's almost hidden. You have these beautiful bright colors and the yellow okras and the browns of the whole scene, but then down in the shadow in front of the store is this little boy, and you see a shadow next to him, and it, at first glance you might just think it's a couple of kids, but it's actually the dog sitting next to the boy watching the wagon go up the street. Until you get a collection of two or three paintings, you don't realize 
that artists do this. In the collection there are several paintings of the museum. And one of these is by Kay Drew. Kay came from a Clarksville family, married a person that was here because of Fort Campbell, actually served as the headmistress of Clarksville Academy for a number of years, and is now back in Clarksville. And this is uh, the only nighttime drawing of the museum, as I understand it. There are several representations of the museum itself, particularly the 1898 building. The building was kind of the standard signature piece that an artist would do for our Flying High events until I think our 25th anniversary, and that was like the final one. And then we started having artists do other scenes and interpretations. But that was kind of the starting point is with that museum building being a focus. I think I have in this collection two paintings by Marvin Posey who is a well-known um, African-American painter and died early in his life. I have a couple that I have in my own personal collection and <laughs> have some that I acquired for First Federal. One of my favorites being Tony Biagi's A Touch of Spring Rhododendrons, which he did in 1997. Here's this fantastic 18 by 24 oil painting with lush colors and reds and pinks and greens. This is a piece by a guy who's known throughout the community for his pen and ink prints that he did of building. So a little off center for what he usually does, which is a great thing to see. One of the paintings we have here was done by Dr. Charles Young, who was in the art department at, at Austin P did many, many paintings of the Clarksville area. I know uh, talking to his son, Ted, who uh, is basketball coach at Clarksville High, that the family has a fairly large collection of his works. In the early days of Clarksville, there just was no market for many of these paintings. Another artist that I liked was uh, Jackie Langford. Jackie would find old photographs and then use these photographs as the basic work for her paintings. This is the painting by Jackie Langford. And if you look at it, you see a couple of farm work vehicles in the foreground. And then if you look down the road, you'll see some others, but not as much detail. As late as 1920s, almost all the county roads were dirt. And so why would these vehicles be drawn up there? It looked like spring, so it wasn't that they were doing any plowing or anything like that. But then when you start looking at it a little more, you'll notice that on the rear of these vehicles was what is referred to as a drag box. This is a heavy box that was used to level out farmland. Or in this particular case, it turns out that in the early days of the county, the county road supervisor could assess local farmers to provide a mule team and a drag box and so many hours of service to take the hump out of these dirt roads that appeared during the winter season when the roads developed deep ruts on either side of the center hump. To me, it was interesting to try to figure out what the picture was about. This painting is the Methodist Church Spires with part of the CCC camp. That's a, what, Civilian Conservation Corps, where young men that had no work were brought in and lived in tents and worked out in the rural farms and this sort of thing to provide labor in the 30s. There are some remnants of that camp in that location. Why was the camp located there? It was because there was a spring in that vicinity, so they had access to water. The camp, as I recall, was a fairly large camp, so it probably extended all the way to the railroad tracks 
coming through town. Because if you think about it, how did these uh, workers get out to the rural areas of the county? More than likely, by rail. I have a few photographs in this collection. One of these is a photograph by Larry Safko. And it shows troops from Fort Campbell marching as part of a parade by the courthouse. Overhead, you see some helicopters flying. And so this was, uh, I think, a return of some of the troops from overseas duty in the 90s to Fort Campbell. If you look at the history of Clarksville, Clarksville's population in around 1940 was something like 10,000 people. But with the rebuilding of Fort Campbell, it became an important asset to our community, bringing people from all over the country to Clarksville. From everything I've ever heard is that Clarksville has the best relationship with military compared to any other community in this country. And that's something that we've worked on for years. Congress said that the military could not lobby for any of their facilities. So uh, we would go and take a group of 40 or 50 people every spring to Washington, D.C. to let our congressmen know, both from Kentucky and Tennessee, what the pressing needs are to improve the facilities at Fort Campbell to make it a better place to live for those troops that live on post. Fort Campbell has become a very, very important part of our community over the history. Now this one is a painting by a person that, in my opinion, is one of the best executive directors we've had for the museum. He has background in marketing. He's an artist himself. This picture was done by Frank Lott. Many people don't know that we had a semi-pro baseball team in Clarksville that was part of the Kitty League. What did you mean by Kitty League? Well, that was a KT, Kentucky, Tennessee League to commemorate the memory of baseball in Clarksville, in particular a Clarksville team that was managed by Hod Lisenby. And as I recall, Hod was a pitcher and one of the things that he managed to do was strike out some batter by the name of Babe, I think it was. Babe Ruth was struck out by a Clarksville pitcher. Tobacco was probably the primary crop in Clarksville, but another crop, I think, was wheat. And so we had a number of mills where the raw grain is brought and then, then milled to produce flour. The farmers didn't have any money, so they would barter and they would leave produce on the back stoop of my grandparents' house in exchange for salt and sugar, ground wheat, and produce that they did not have on their farm. And this is the way these rural families survived the Depression. Just little facts like this, I think, make the community more important. One of the spectacular things about having this collection now in-house at the museum is not only can we show it as an entire entity on its own, but we can pull pieces from it and work with other things we have in the collection to create other shows, particularly like featuring women artists, which I try to do every spring during Women's History Month. It adds just another layer to that body of work, so we're really excited about having these pieces with us. I would hope that the collection can grow. 
I don't know that it will grow with my name attached to it, but that's not significant. But I think as Clarksville grows, we're talking about growing, what, 20,000 or more in the next 20 years. We already know that because of Fort Campbell, that we have a lot of people that only came to Clarksville because of Fort Campbell. And so they really don't know the history of the, of the community. And having a place such as the Custom House Museum gives a place for a transplant to Clarksville, either permanently or otherwise, can find about and learn about what Clarksville was. If you don't preserve it, it'll be lost. These are parts of the history of our community that we don't really need to lose. And so by having paintings like this, by having video like this that, that sort of talks about the history of Clarksville, I think will help us educate our children on what Clarksville was and is and hopes to be in the future. For current and exclusive content, subscribe to CDE Lightband, connecting you at the speed of light.